Hi there, and welcome once again to That's English. The end. What? Well, not yet. We've still got today's program. No, I meant the end of the book I was reading. I had to find out who the murderer was. So you like whodunits, do you? Oh yes, I do. Well, our final documentary is all about crime fiction. We meet a real crime writer, and we also hear from a company that acts out murder mysteries. It's two o'clock in the morning. The tension is building. You should be turning out the light, but instead you just keep turning the page. There's no chance of sleep until you reach the very end. There's a dead body, and plenty of clues. But who is the murderer? Every night, thousands of people are unable to sleep because they're addicted to the twists and turns of the mystery or crime novel. Some 65% of people in the UK say they regularly read mysteries, commonly known as whodunits. Len, better known as L. C. Tyler, is chairman of the British Crime Writers Association. And author of the Elsie and Ethelred mysteries, he tells us why crime fiction is so popular. Crime novels always have been immensely popular. The reader is invited to solve、um, the, the crime, and one of the interesting things is that crime novels became popular at about the same time as crosswords became popular, appealing to a very similar audience. Len explains how writers construct murder plots. I think with any crime story, there are in effect two parallel plots. There is the real plot, who killed who, what they did next, how they covered it up, and at the same time, there is what you might describe as the virtual plot. What the reader actually believes is happening, what the writer wants them to believe is happening, and when those two things converge. You reach the resolution of the of the story, but how difficult is it to come up with an ending to a story where all the clues are brought together? Very often, I will write the ending first,、um, so that I know where I'm going.、Um, in fact, what I often end up with is the ending which I've written, and the beginning, and then this enormous gap in the middle of the book. I hate middles of the books. <laughs> The most successful crime writer of all time is Agatha Christie. She published her first book in the twenties and went on to sell more than two billion books. What she was really, really good at was telling a story, and she just had the ability to spin the story, which would wind you in. She's remained popular, of course. Um, because I think she's got wonderful marketing at the moment.、Um, the books reissued, great covers, and of course Poirot and Marple are always on television. Of course, other people succeeded her.、Um, P. D. James, Barbara Vine were very much seen as her successors, as the Queen of Crime. But Christie was a one-off. She was unique, and I don't really think she's like anyone else. The British public don't just love reading mysteries; they like acting them out too. Owed money to four different girls. Murder Experts is a company that puts on murder mystery events where guests take part in a staged murder plot. Peter Giles is the managing director of Murder Experts. He explains what's involved. We provide professional murder mysteries. Basically, we go around、uh, venues such as hotels, country houses, and we send. Usually around seven to eight actors、um, to perform a, a mystery for the guests to solve. It's difficult to produce an ending to a plot. That is the hardest thing of writing a plot: to make sure that all the clues and all the evidence and the things that the actors are going to say during the evening balance and point to that direction. So why do we all love a good murder? I guess it does. Give people an intellectual puzzle to solve.、Um, there's a sense of justice at the end when everything turns out right, and when the guilty party in our murder mysteries are arrested by whoever's playing the inspector, there's usually a big cheer. So maybe our love for crime and mysteries is because we like to see good win over evil, even if we have to wait until the very last page to find out who done it. Those murder mystery events look fun. 
and I was amazed to hear that Agatha Christie is still so popular after all these years. As Len said, she just had the ability to spin or tell a story that would just wind you in and get you hooked. He described what's involved in writing a crime novel very clearly. I think with any crime story, there are, in effect, two parallel plots. There is the real plot, who killed who, what they did next, how they covered it up. And at the same time, there is what you might describe as the virtual plot. What the reader actually believes is happening, what the writer wants them to believe is happening. And when those two things converge, you reach the resolution of the, of the story. So it's all about deceiving the reader with a parallel plot. Interesting. Now let's move on. As you know, our theme today is endings. So we asked our international friends, what happens when a loved one dies in your country? Traditionally, if you're a Maori, you have a tangi, which is a wake that lasts several days. However, amongst all communities, it's becoming fashionable to have yourself turned into a snow cone. And that is when your ashes are put into a little cone and you shake it at Christmas time and it looks as though it's snowing. There's quite a big deal made of, made of whenever someone dies in Ireland. It's very different to, to England, for example, um, where we have a three-day wake uh, before the burial. And whenever the, the, uh, the individual is being taken in the hearse, the entire family and friends will walk behind the hearse we would have a funeral um, in Scotland. Funerals are big. People like to re pay their respects to the families. There's a big turnout. People make food. There's, they buy drinks for people and they like to show their respect to the family. Funerals are more relaxed than they used to be. They are family events more than church events. And we celebrate the passing of somebody's life. There's a custom in India. I'm not which is not practiced anymore, but used to, uh, Rudali. Uh, these are the people, pe professional mourners. They used to hire, people used to hire them to come to the funeral and they used to mourn for the, the departed. When somebody dies, a notice is put into the newspaper and that's called an obituary. Usually it's a, it's a funeral, a wake, um, and uh, then a, a lot of uh, memory and you know, chatting with uh, family members and friends about the dearly departed. Everyone agrees that it's important to celebrate the life of a loved one. In Ireland, a wake or funeral lasts for three days and the mourners walk behind the hearse. That's the funeral car. In Scotland, there's a big turnout. A lot of people come to pay their respects, which means to show respect for the deceased, the person who has died. Well, now it's time to join Alex on the last leg of his journey. Today, he's in New Haven in Connecticut, a city famous for its inventions, including the first hamburger sandwich. For a smallish city, New Haven's got a lot to offer, as we'll see. <laughs> Hello, I'm in New Haven, the second largest city in the state of Connecticut. New Haven was founded in 1638 by English Puritans. One of the things New Haven is most famous for is its food. I'm at Louis' Lunch, the birthplace of the hamburger sandwich. This family-owned restaurant was opened in 1895. Hamburgers cooked here are still prepared using traditional methods. I'm here with Jeff Lassen, part owner at Louis' Lunch. Jeff, can you tell me a little about the history of your family and the restaurant? Uh, I'm actually the fourth generation proprietor, and we've been in business 120 years. And my great-grandfather made the first hamburger sandwich in the United States in the year 1900. What are some of the traditions you still keep here? Well, the main one is that we cook the burgers in the same antique broilers that we cooked the original back in 1900. Uh, we still have the same toaster from 1929. We cut and grind our own meat fresh every day. Uh, it's five different blends, which is our only secret, and the same uh, garnishes, tomato and onion. Well, great. I really appreciate your time. I'm ready to try these hamburgers. Well, let's get to it. All right.
Wooster Street is considered New Haven's Little Italy. This is the place to come for pizza. Frank Pepe opened his Neapolitan Pizzeria here in 1925. It's the fourth oldest in the United States and many think it's the best. Schubert Theater is a 1600 seat theater in the heart of New Haven. It was opened in 1914 and has held more stage debuts than any theater on Broadway in New York City. Some of the most famous shows including My Fair Lady, The Sound of Music, and A Streetcar Named Desire starring Marlon Brando were launched right here on this stage. New Haven is also home to Yale University. It's the third oldest university in the USA and it counts five American presidents among its alumni, including Bill Clinton. The university is the biggest employer in New Haven. Its impressive buildings dominate much of the city. The university's history is integral to the spirit and culture of the city, and the constant influx of students brings a vibrant energy to New Haven. I'm here with Colin Kaplan on New Haven Green. Colin is a New Haven tour guide and has written several books about the city. Colin, what do you think is so special about New Haven? Well, you've got lots of inventions and inventors who were here. Some of those inventions include the lollipop, which was invented by the Bradley Smith Company in 1903. He named it after a horse that won a race. So this is amazing invention of a taffy on a stick started here in New Haven. Oh, okay. But there have been some sports-related inventions here too, right? Absolutely. The invention of modern American football started here by Walter Camp, who was the captain of the Yale rugby team and eventually the football team. He created modern American football, changing the rules of rugby and practicing first on the green here. Uh, we invented the Frisbee here, and it was a special invention by Yale students who were ordering Mrs. Frisbee's pies out of Bridgeport, Connecticut. And these pies, including this pie bottom, um, was actually the original Frisbee. So they would take this pie bottom and they would turn it upside down and then swing it. Okay. Well, do you have a Frisbee we can play with? I sure do. Well, excellent. Let's yeah, play. Let's do this. In a city with so many beginnings, our journey is finally coming to an end. I hope you've enjoyed it as much as I have. Goodbye from me, and goodbye from the U.S. So, the original Frisbee was a pie dish. And the lollipop was named after a horse. Colin described it as taffy on a stick. Taffy is an American chewy sweet or candy. The hamburgers Jeff was cooking in those old grillers looked delicious. You know, he refuses to have ketchup in his restaurant. He wants his burgers to taste completely natural. He's quite right. <laughs> well, I'm afraid we've come to the end of Module 12 and the end of this series of That's English. We do hope you've enjoyed learning with us. Make sure you keep practising your English. We wish you all the best for the future. Goodbye. 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 Goodbye.